what we are going to discuss this evening is about affordability of drugs. And this, of course, is linked to pricing of drugs. And pricing of drugs has become a very sensitive issue over the past year, maybe years. I have followed Thomas Pogge over the past years, and I have become more and more fascinated and more and more, let's say, convinced that this way of approaching a reward to pharmaceutical firms, firms and making drugs more available is an absolutely good way to do a good way to approach it. Process patent protects a particular way of making a medicine, but if you are clever and you find another way of making the same molecule, you could, without violation of the patent, produce it. Generic companies were very good at doing that. And since there are quite a number of generic companies in India, they competed with each other and got the price way down to something like a hundredth or even a thousandth of the price that the brand name pharmaceutical companies would charge. Indian uh, manufacturers would sell the product all over the developing world. They couldn't sell it into the developed countries because their patent law was much stricter. And so they made sure that poor people had access even to advanced medicines within a year or so of when rich people would get access. Tom Donaldson from the Wharton School, and he's going to address what is the business of biotech all about? And the reason why I invited Tom is very simple. Tom was here about a month or so ago, and Tom had a, had a lecture here in the business school about a theory of the business. And I attended that meeting, and when I left that meeting, I was reflecting on what Tom said. I said, well, this is actually what we have been waiting for. This is what we need, a theory of the business, to reflect on what the business in fact is. I've studied corporate Watergate uh, most of my career. Most of them involve companies that didn't have the courage to speak up. Imagine the courage it took to intentionally, deliberately create cheat devices for 11 million diesel automobiles. So in all these ways, the Health Impact Fund would be an improvement on the present system. And there are a few bonuses that are worth mentioning, additional improvements. One is that there would be an incentive to anticipate and prepare for epidemics. Uh, of course, pharmaceutical companies have a great incentive to do this now with regard to epidemics that affect rich people. They would have an incentive to do that for poor people, Ebola and so on, if we had the Health Impact Fund in play. Business people are not devils. They have moral notions uh, and, and yet, we tend to revert often to this notion that we'd like them to be better, but somehow when they get in firms, the firms themselves end up constrained in a way such that they can only act in their self-interest, only for maximal benefit to the owners. Now, how does the Health Impact Fund address that? We can address that by building that into the incentive structure. We can say you get paid for health impact that your drug produces, but you also get a premium, you get a special payment for preserved efficacy. So if your drug still works on pretty much all patients after five years or after 10 years, you get an extra chunk of money for having preserved the efficacy of the drug. First, I've already told you I'm a supporter of the HIF, but I think along with most sociologists, along with most international theorists, the designers of the HIF take for granted a classical view of the nature of business. It's drawn from our interpretation of theories of the firm that is fading and badly in need of reconstruction. I recall not so long ago being uh, at ate lunch with uh, head of the finance department at NYU, New York University Stern School of Business, they, like Wharton, sent a lot of their graduates to Wall Street. And he was reminiscing uh, about how often he'd been asked the question, you know, why is it these, these people on Wall Street in the run-up to the financial crisis uh, were using models, the assumptions of which uh, didn't hold up, that neglected things like systemic risk, and it was used those models that helped bring the world economy down. And his face darkened, and he turned to me and said, I'll tell you why they were using those models. That's the models we taught them. Those are the models that we taught them to use. And 
What I want to suggest this evening is that the models we're teaching in the Smurfit School at Wharton uh, all around the world are very powerful, very helpful. We don't want to throw them out, but they're sadly in need of something else, a broader perspective. 